hello and welcome to my front yard such as it is it is the usual grass in front and then a bunch of kind of half dead weeds towards the back there it doesn't look too bad in the summer considering it's weeds but this year i've decided i am going to clear all this out and we are going to make a beautiful delicious maybe veggie garden and of course the very first thing i thought was how do i make this medieval now we've got a lot of options there from your plain old farm fields that have been tilled and sown with a bunch of the same seeds. We also have lots of gardens that are your flower and rose admiring and enjoying sort of variety. And then we also have these little gardens that are very geometric, lots of little squares and rectangles set together in very satisfying patterns. And those ones are likely mostly herbs and like little flowers, but I think we can get away with doing vegetables in those. I, I, I feel like we can make it happen. Now, while there were very cool medieval ones, I ended up really falling in love with this like mid tutor ish one that had this green fence and there's like a pattern around the outside and little squares on the inside and the inside is set on a diamond. It's very cool. I'm into it and that's what we're doing. I tried to go for a vaguely Tudor vibe to celebrate the decision. Uh, I got distracted. And we've somehow ended up with like Italian Renaissance mushroom woman, but that's okay, it's fine. <laughs> so I've actually done a lot since the last time you saw me a second ago. We have taken down all of that trellis structure. It was falling apart like we could have done some fixes somewhere like to give it another couple of years but it's been up for i think since the house was built it was time for it to go there were bits in the posts that were rotted out at the bottom it was time so we took all of that down we moved some of the plants and since everything is all cleared out of here we also took the chance to get it all nice and flattened it was quite uh, <laughs> hilly dippy dripping hazards so it was really neat to get a chance to get it completely flattened out now I think we are ready for the beds themselves which I'm really excited about because we are using wood from one of our trees which I just I always think that's so cool we took down one of the trees that we had earmarked for this and got it cut it up milled into slices I say we Mr. Morgan Donner did mm, almost all of that. I did lots of mulching. I turned lots of branches into little tiny bits of wood that will also be used for the garden. Uh, but he did all the milling. That bit over there, that's all me. From there, those got put into just simple little square boxes. I did a ton of drawing out our area and kind of mapping it, measuring it, measuring it like five more times to make sure I got it right so that we could have a really precise idea of what we wanted to do. Now, it's not going to be an exact reproduction of this image with the green fence that I love so much, but it's gonna be pretty dang close. Hi, puppies. So next up, we are going to take these lovely balsam fir beds and get them placed into their new homes. I'm gonna try and make sure that they are as level as possible because when you water them, you don't want them to be uneven and have the water whoosh, moving your, your dirt and seeds around. So you want it to be nice and level if we can manage that. The fence itself though is gonna come later on. First up, beds, the fence posts and things are still being constructed, but we need to get a start on this to get things growing. So for our leveling, I'm using a trusty level, although Mr. Donner was telling me that historically they might have used something like a plumb bob. No, not, not this kind. More like a weight at the end of a string, which would give you a perfect vertical because it's gonna hang vertically, which is neat. And then of course the perpendicular to that would be perfectly horizontal, which is just very cool, very clever thing that I had never considered, but I'm gonna use the modern version. Behold, the final locations of all of my beds. I kept moving them around, trying to like really settle in on where I wanted them. Even though I spent so much time doing drawings to decide where I wanted them to be, I still had that last minute fussiness. And I think we're finally good. I have them level 
ish level enough and now we're going to go ahead and fill them up now i have a big pile of dirt kind of behind me off screen here but i'm not sure that i quite have enough to fill the beds all the way so i'm going to gather up some of the various sticks and twigs from the tree that this wood came from toss them in the bottom uh, a lot of mulch. I've got tons of leaves from last fall. So I can just shove a bunch of that in here to help fill up like a couple inches. And that I think should be enough to supplement and make it so that I can fill the rest of the beds with nice dirt. Oh, and compost. I've got a bunch of compost that I got from a friend of a friend whose parents own a horse farm, cow farm. I've lost track of the details, but we have some nice aged compost that is also going to go in with these. Look at all these peonies coming in. So cute! Little buddies! The beds are nice and filled and ready to have things planted inside of them. A uh, little side note, I totally had enough dirt over there to fill the beds all the way with just dirt, but uh, I'm not going to take the, the sticks out now. What's, what's done is done. Right now, we need to focus on what is going to go into the dirt. I decided that in keeping with the whole vaguely medieval Tudor garden, I should plant things that are within that theme. Part of the benefit of this is that I love a good theme, but also there's, there's just so many plants, y'all. I needed something to help reduce that list down to something a little bit more mentally manageable. If you are trying to go for, you know, what would your average medieval peasant have had access to, or even just even your fancy medieval peasants, there's a lot of things that that takes off the table. All your tomatoes, your potatoes, your corn, uh, peppers, a bunch of things that I think of as part of my kind of normal everyday diet, gone. <laughs> but that makes it so that we are left with still a ton of options, but it just reduces it down to a smaller pool to pick from. I started planning out my garden back when I still had two feet of snow on the ground, and that gave me plenty of time to not only look into what was vaguely historically plausible, but also what was recommended for beginners. I looked at every different version of top 10 recommended plants for beginner growers and compiled my own little list of everything all together and you know made my final decisions between that and the historical bit like picked my stuff i probably should have picked half of what i did but whatever i got my seeds i planned my layout i'm all like super ready and set to go and had to wait another two months for the snow to actually melt so that I could get to the place that the garden was gonna be. I wish I had had the new book from June's Journey who are the kind sponsors of today's video. I've been talking about June's Journey, the mobile game for years, and I will pop a link down in the description in case you haven't checked it out yet. But sometimes it is nice to put down your phone and do something a little quieter, a little slower, and much like gardening, this isn't something you rush. I love that I can recognize several of the scenes from within the game and the activities, but they've also added new ones like puzzles and mazes and, you know, writing prompts, things like that. And the book itself is just really beautifully done, beautifully printed. I love the cover and it has this really great art deco style end page. The June's Journey activity book is available for pre-order now and will be released on November 21st. I feel like this would be fantastic to have during family holidays. There's always so much downtime and as someone who constantly needs to keep her hands busy, <laughs> this is gonna come in handy. This is a limited print, so get your copy fast and it's gonna come with a little in-game exclusive item with it. Actually, as luck would have it, the team at June's Journey set aside several for me to give away to you guys so I will put a link down in the description and you can maybe get your very own copy I think I'm gonna make this one short like just 48 hours so that that way it can get its merry way onto the winners ASAP and for everybody else go check out that order when it comes out November 21st all right I think I am now ready to go ahead and plant those seeds I went ahead and prepped the things that needed prepping, like there were some seeds that needed to soak overnight, and then I got to work with planting, which I've gotta say, I am maybe a little behind schedule. This is 
four or five days or so after my last frost date for my area, which for those that are unfamiliar, a lot of baby plants are very, very sensitive to freezing temperatures. So you wanna make sure that you've gone after the date in which you are likely to have freezing temperatures at night because you don't wanna kill off all your brand new little baby plants. Although some things you wanna plant a lot sooner than that. So, I mean, I'm not late. I'm just very distinctly not early. <laughs> I think I'm gonna start with carrots first. And because I have a few varieties of not just the carrots, very lovely medieval vegetable, I have several varieties of several different things and I don't wanna forget what's what. I have stolen a bunch of bits of wood from Mr. Donner's Woodshop Zone to make myself some little labels with the plant names written on. I can stick them at the rows. I don't actually know that they would have used label markers because probably if you've grown up sowing vegetables and harvesting them and what have you you just know what that plant looks like when it's real cute and little whereas i have no idea what any of these look like when they're cute and little so i i'm gonna go ahead and label mine in addition to the labels, I also wrote down where I planted everything. Like I named each of the beds with this little layout here, A, B, C, D, E. And then I wrote on each page, like for bed A, what items I planted in that bed and in what order. So that will hopefully be good. Although I do feel like this last bed in the middle, I got a bit lazy because there's only a few items on this list and I feel like there was more. Anyways, but now that the seed planting situation is done, we need to think next about watering. In our reference images, it looks like a lot of them are planting near water so that they have really good access to fresh water to water all those plants. And while I do have a nearby stream and a bucket that I could potentially procure water from, I think I'm gonna take the modern way out and just use a modern hose. While I do love historical know-how, I think it's very cool, I also appreciate modern convenience. So I researched and bought an irrigation kit with a fancy little timer and everything and then connected that up to my water hose. I very lightly buried that hose so that it would be protected from lawnmowers or errant feet just a couple inches under the ground. Today I am working on the eventual irrigation system. I have finished laying the main half inch tubing so that each of the beds has water traveling from the faucet to the bed and now I'm going to add on to this at this bed here and make some uh, smaller tubing that does like little drip 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 drips. Going back to our historical versions of garden beds, the height seems to vary quite a bit. Some of them are so low that they're basically in line with the ground. Some of them maybe a couple inches up and others raised honestly so much that they look a lot like modern raised beds. That is the route that I obviously decided to go with. And in particular, there's some really cute, cute beds that had like these external supports that I really like the look of. So that's the visual we're aiming for here. These are the stakes to go on the side. We're just pre-drilling some holes really quick and then sort of staking them in next to the boards to help reinforce that area. Now we are properly ready to get started on the fence itself. We got all of the posts prepared and painted with the green linseed oil paint. And we did end up needing to purchase some more wood for the rails. We weren't quite able to get all of the fence materials out of that one tree, but we went ahead and got those rails cut down to the right length and then drilled so we could add the little tiny row of pickets. We ended up leaving the ones on the bottom row round and just sort of pencil sharpened the pickets in to fit, but then we changed to a more mortise and tenon style fit for the top row, or I guess the middle rail. The very last of the mortises. These are where the little sticks will go in, and this was much faster than trying to make the sticks circular, is to make the squares. Whole, the whole square. No, the whole square, yes. <laughs> Here, yes. I brought you a stick for demonstration purposes. Oh yes, yeah. so before we had to put circular part in, now, yeah, that's a good stick, sir. That's a square peg in a square hole. <laughs> 
The rails all got hammered and nailed into section by section until the whole fence was completely done, or at least constructed done. We still need to get everything all painted. First, I worked on cleaning up that bottom edge since it had been up for a few weeks. So a bit of grass had grown in front of it and it had gotten kind of dirty. So I got all that cleaned up. I have a little bit of leftover, mostly linseed with a little bit of blue pigment left over from a different project I'm working on right now. And I think I'm gonna use this bottle, bottle jar up on the bottom. I think that any like little bit of blue that is visible on the wood should be completely covered up by the next couple coats. Everything that didn't get that initial blue tinged linseed oil coat got a normal coat of linseed without any pigment in it. We let that settle for a bit and then we went ahead and did the second green coat all over everything. I do want to mention that we initially painted the posts in the garage. Painting jig. So many poles for a painting jig. Bye bye and it took forever for them to dry. And so I did a bit of reading and research to figure out what was up. And it turns out that there probably wasn't as much airflow as there could have been. And something about having the, both the air and like the UV of sun rays touching it seems to make it cure a lot faster. So that's what I was hearing would be recommended. And it did. <laughs> this coat that we did on the rails dried so much faster. Within a day or two, it was touchable. The very last thing here is the finials, which is the bit that goes on top of each of the posts. We got them set up all together on a board so that they were super easy to access and then painted them up with yellow linseed oil. I gave them a couple weeks to dry since they were inside of a closed room. I did try to open up the windows a bit to get some airflow in, but I just didn't use this room for a few weeks and it was fine. Once they were completely dry to the touch, I removed them from that little painting board and started attaching them to the top of each of the posts. You wanna know what's kind of funny? I didn't realize until basically after the posts were already attached that I clearly did not look at the original source painting very closely because not all of the posts are shaped that way. There's several of them that look like they're maybe little animals like monkeys or dogs or something kind of sitting on top of the posts. <laughs> Whoops, that's okay. I think these round posts will do just fine. Hello, little buddy. I very nearly stepped on you, bud. While the fence was underway, I went and bought a bunch of stones from our local quarry and plopped them all over the yard, trying to nicely Tetris everything together. And once I was mostly happy with the location of each of the stones, I also dug down on the thicker ones so that the overall pathway was nice and flat and flush-ish. I didn't want any stones that were sticking up much higher or lower than any of the others. I also shoveled some wood chips into the, the kind of cracks, the crevices between the stones. So that, that was beautifully visually filled in. Oh my gosh, look at all these cute little radish spruits. You can hardly read it, but it does say radish. They're so cute and there's so many. The other two next door need to catch up. This is a little circle of onions that I put around the rosemary and for some reason it just delights the heck out of me. Circle of onions. As our plant life got taller, there ended up being little bits and pieces of maintenance that were needed. Like these peas really wanted something to hold on to and I had to convince them to not hold on to themselves. So I grabbed some sticks, maybe about half an inch in diameter, cut them all to the same length, about three feet or so, just under a meter. I then very inexpertly tied them together to try and create a little trellis structure. I wove some twine around it so that the pea vines had something to climb onto and I did one set of them vertically with the string and another set I did horizontally with the string because I was curious to see which I would like better. I do think the vertical was better. Other maintenance that needed to be done was thinning the plants that I planted way too many of. This little bundle of carrots is way, way, way too close. So we need to try and move out some of them. I'm gonna try and just pick some that are kind of in the middle here so that hopefully ones towards the outer edge have some room to grow. I'm trying, if I can, to pick smaller specimens and letting the 
more robust big ones be so that they can hopefully become very big in the future. Okay, so now I've got three right here, probably about an inch apart. It's probably still too close, but uh, eh, good enough. There was also plenty of weeding to do. A ton of things popped up that I did not plan. This one is lettuce, and this one is peas. Sir, sir, you have not been invited to this party. There isn't supposed to be anything between these two trellises. I've got peas here and peas here and a bunch of stuff I didn't plant in the middle. I've only ever experienced grass lawns before, so this was just such a neat, different type of maintenance. It's also kind of interesting to think about what is considered a weed. What's desirable in one instance is undesirable in another, like these dang wild strawberries kept popping up in all my beds. I love strawberries, I do, but I do not want their cute little leaves popping up in my beds. They are all over the rest of my lawn. I, I don't need them in the beds. I think I am actually ready to harvest the very first crop from the garden. The radishes here in this row are now about 35 days in, which from what I can tell means they should be ready. So let's take a look. Well, I guess the only way to find out is just to start pulling some up. Oh, that, that looks like a radish. Oh, look at how cute. So wee, so cute. That's another very wee cute little radish. Yeah, I'm wondering if I did not thin most of these enough. Oh, that one's got a, got a little bit to it. So I picked about a third of them and they're not the biggest radishes I've ever seen, but you know, it is what it is. I'm going to go ahead and get these cleaned off. We will take them inside maybe have the, the greens and the radishy bits for lunch. And I'll see about doing the next few. I think I'm going to go ahead and replant in the area that I took these out from since I think I have enough time to go ahead and grow a couple more batches of these. Part of the fun of this whole gardening project is forcing myself to go look up recipes for not just what we might consider the main crop of the plant, like the root for radishes, but also seeing what else is edible, like the leaves in this case can be sauteed and eaten kind of like spinach. Elsewhere in the garden, I have a very healthy crop of apparently carrots, maybe? I admit that when it came to this middle bed, I was so I was so careful with marking what all of the other different, oh, that bed has flowers. Okay, I'm gonna show you that in a second. But I was so careful with all the other beds, documenting what row was planted, what plant. But when it got to the middle, I, I kind of started getting lazy. And I do recall taking some seeds and just being like, meh. But I thought it was dill. This is definitely not dill, it is either carrots that I have strewn about this bed or maybe for some reason this patch of dirt was wildly infested with a uh, wild carrot which Queen Anne's lace is the same plant and then here are the flowers on the peas these were not here I swear like yesterday and suddenly we, we have little flowers on the peas which is exciting theoretically that means that we will have peas before too, too long here. Now that the five main beds are all done and taken care of, we can start looking at that perimeter bed around the edge. The plan for this one is just flowers. I got a bag of local New England wildflowers, even though it is a little bit too late, honestly, to be planting them. I still wanted to get at least something in the ground growing this season. I also got several grown flowering plants to put in from a local nursery. At least that way I could have some color in that perimeter bed this year. I also borrowed some plants from elsewhere in the yard where things were getting a bit crowded and I, I knew I had the space to pick up some stuff and plop it into my, my new bed. We planted some blueberries earlier this spring uh, when they were still bare root and cute little babies. And now they looks like all three are thriving very nicely. But I do feel like this daily lily is starting to kind of encroach on their space, so I think I'm gonna move her. Rocks everywhere, rocks everywhere. Somewhere I will find where the dirt this is actually buried in. Oh my god. Success. Now we're just gonna divide this up into a couple sections. 
I even took some of the spent marigold flowers, the, the bits that become the seeds, and opened them up and tossed them in for good measure. They probably are not going to sprout, but we'll just pretend this is like a trial run for next spring. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things just isn't the same. Yeah, so one of my lettuces has, has bolted very mightily. It is time to aggressively start eating salads before the rest of these bolt. I really enjoyed being able to run out and grab some bit of vegetable for lunch or dinner to, to supplement my, my normal meals. It was a lot of fun and I feel like I learned so much throughout this whole adventure, more than I think I can even properly organize my thoughts on to express. Let's start off by just saying what went well, which is we made a garden. Mr. Morgan, Donner, and I made a whole ding-dang garden. It's something that's always super intimidated me, and I'm, I'm just proud that I can say we made a garden. I really, really love how it all looks. It's not a perfect replica of that Tudor inspiration garden, but it's notably, visibly close, and I think it all just looks great. I think the fence looks great, the beds look great, the rock pathway in the middle looks great. It all just very visibly pleasing. Not only did it look good, I dare say it was pretty dang functional. Like, I remember thinking before I did any planting that if even 50% of the plants grew and I was able to like nibble on some of those, success. And you know what? Yeah, I absolutely smashed that goal. Lastly, I feel like I learned a ton that is gonna come in handy for next year. I think out of everything that I grew, the peas was probably my favorite. I did three different varieties and I put them in three different places. I tried a couple different trellising methods with each one. So it was really fun to experiment with how those three little test rounds would go. And they were all quite different. This one ended up way overgrowing its trellis. So it grew fell back down like the vine and then grew back up again. So I just have these huge, like, it needs like a six foot trellis or something for, for next time. But the other one, what is this? Two and a half feet or so? Perfect, absolutely, exactly right. And then the one back there, it didn't need a trellis at all, although half the seeds didn't germinate. I don't know. That one was kind of a eh all around but uh, I do like the first two and it's, it's just very funny seeing how the different varieties came out. Now maybe for some things that didn't go so well, like ah, first I was so excited for that little irrigation system that I looked into and installed and you know what? It ended up raining basically the whole entire summer. I swear it was raining every other day. <laughs> and besides watering the seeds the very first week that they were planted, I didn't need to do any watering the whole entire summer. I ended up never even installing the drip line part of the irrigation. I just did the main hose because it just, it never ended up being necessary. That said, I do not regret putting them in because at least I was able to get those main hose lines installed around all of the, the rocks in the pathway and it's, it's all ready and set to go for next year. Secondly, I bit off a bit more than I can chew, literally. <laughs> I think each bed had maybe an average of seven different things in it and I think it would have been far kinder to myself to just plant maybe two different things in each bed. In that same vein, I do wish I had been a bit more considerate of what I planted, what types of food that I was planting. Like, I love a good salad, sure, but not that much. I planted way too much lettuce, and I also planted some varieties that I was unfamiliar with, and it turns out I don't like the taste of. So there's a bunch of lettuce that I just ended up not eating because it's gross. On the other end of that spectrum, I love onions. Love cooking with onions, love eating onions, and I only planted maybe 10? That's not enough. Next year, I want a whole bed at least of just onions. And then lastly, for what few onions I did plant, I ended up putting so many carrots around them that I think the, the carrot greens grew up and kind of over competed 
with the onions and they didn't get enough light slash air space, what have you. <laughs> and they did not get very big at all. I will also not be planting dill with my carrots in the future because I just, I couldn't find them amongst the carrot greens. Dill's gonna get its own section next time. You know, all around, I think I planted way too many carrots. I've been eating a ton of them and yet there's still a ton in the ground. Like it, <laughs> winter is coming and I have just kind of left them in there because at least I know that I don't need to prioritize pulling them before first frost since they'll be fine even as it gets colder. Speaking of first frost, once I realized that autumn was well and truly underway and I had just a few weeks left <laughs> to take care of all the beds, I had a whole laundry list of things to do to kind of help put the beds to sleep for winter. This set of peas are completely, absolutely dead and done, which means that we can go ahead and take out this whole trellis situation. And I'm gonna try and collect as many of the dried seed pods as I can. I tried to leave some of the happiest looking ones on here and not eat them so that theoretically the best ones are going to become next year's peas. To clean up the beds, I took all of the plants that had seeds, like the lettuce and the radishes, and I put those into paper bags so that the seeds can continue drying and be ready for use for next year. Anything that didn't have seeds, I could just leave there, although some of them I cut short, some of them I left tall, like the carrots, because they do pretty well even into the quite cold temperatures. I planted one whole bed of garlic, which I'm really excited about. It's one of those plants that you actually want to plant in the fall, a few weeks before that first frost, unlike a lot of other stuff. And so those got planted. We kind of just broke up the bulbs and planted them evenly down and then gave it a huge, big batch of leaves over top so that they could be all cuddled in and warm and happy. Uh, actually, all of the beds got a whole bunch of fall leaves to help protect the beds. If you don't have a bunch of leaves, then I think you could do things like straw, not hay. Hay is the one with seeds, right? I actually ended up doing a few rounds of placing leaves because as they were put down, they would kind of condensed down after a little bit and so there was more room available for me to toss some more leaves on to try and keep the the top soil from like drying out and cracking and being coming all sad over the winter. I also planted some flower bulbs around the perimeter so that those can do their cozy winter thing and then pop up all happy and cute in the spring. Lastly, I did take down that irrigation timer in case you thought I forgot and got the faucet all capped off and now the whole garden is ready for winter. I am so looking forward to planning and then implementing next year's garden. Like there's so many things that I am gonna definitely plant again, like the, the peas, tons of onions, way more dill this time, and then tone it down on things like carrots, lettuce, cabbage, me. Although I think I might specifically let the radishes go to seed. I really, really liked those seed pods. They're kind of like a spicy pea. I'll probably add some new world foods into the mix, like tomatoes and peppers will be so good. Like I just, I look forward so much to what I'm gonna learn next year. Like since this summer was so wet, it's going to be very different from what I experience next year. Like I had very little in the way of pest problems, some, but not much, but who knows what next year will be like. So many of my projects are very one and done. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the fact that this is something that I get to kind of re-engage with year after year after year to whatever level I want. You know, if I wanna do a bunch of different vegetables again in the future, I can. If one year I'm like, I don't feel like vegetables and I just do a bunch of flowers, I can do that. Like, I'm really excited. I do wanna say that if you are thinking about starting a garden next year, if you can, if it's not already too late, Start your beds now, even one bed, so that you're not scrambling to do it all next year, right after the snows melt and you just you don't have enough time to do everything. It's, it's so much better if you can prep your beds now and put just one crop in there, a bunch of clover or something, and then cut that down and plant something new in the next spring. You're, you're 
cutting off half your work if you can do some of that bed building now. Alternatively, I suppose if you are in the southern hemisphere, then you are already in your growing season. But, uh, you know, do a bed anyway. I feel like you don't have to be silly and do six beds and a fence and a stone path and everything all in the first go. I'm just very silly. So do a bed, plant a thing, see what happens. Like that all on its own is very rewarding. Thanks again to June's Journey for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget to enter the giveaway or buy yourself a copy before they all run out. All right, toodles.